but it will prosper When the darkness falls, it won't be here Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph My God will never fail My God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to me, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to me, Lord. Oh, 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 oh. This
out together, church. Let's proclaim it. We are victorious in Jesus Christ. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. One more time, proclaim it. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Amen. I want to sing this out together. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That had saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. Lift it up together. Let's praise God. Praise God, 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 praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. We bow our hearts, we bend our knees, O oh Spirit, come make us humble. We turn our eyes from evil things, O oh Lord, we cast down our idols to give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. Oh, Lord, we 
us clean hands, oh God. Give us pure hearts. Let us not lift our souls to another. you get shy on me, lift up your songs, you've got a lion inside of those songs, get up and praise the Lord, come on my son, don't you get shy on me, lift up your songs, you've got a lion inside
seated. All right, man, are you guys fully awake? Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny, for that message. Um, So if if you need to go to the restroom, please feel free to step out. Um, Again, the restrooms are back there. If you need to go to the other restroom, go down the hallway to the left. Um, So our next speaker is uh, the senior pastor of here, Calvary Chapel, Glendale. Uh, Some of you guys know him as Art, but here in the church we know him as the Mexican surfer. So uh, why don't we welcome uh, Pastor Art. (laughs) I haven't ridden a board in quite a while. Last time I rode a board, I got hit by another surfer. He wiped out and this board went flying and hit me right in the forehead. That was back in the days when you didn't have the ankle leashes. You had to, when you wiped out, way out, you had to swim to the shore to get your board and then go back out. Was, that's how long it's been, uh, if, you can, if, if you can relate to that. But uh, we're continuing in the book of Romans, chapter eight. I'm covering verses 12 to 17 the sonship through the spirit. Now, when the, when the sections were being passed around, you know, Johnny, Dickie, and Asher, they got all the, the real easy ones, and they left me the, the hard stuff. I, got, I always get the hard one. Uh, Dickie, why is it that I always get the hard one? I don't know. We've been doing this for a while. I always get the hard one. So I'm going to begin with this. It is possible to live a resurrection life now, while we're here on earth, through faith in Christ Jesus, this is good news for all of us, right? You see, when you come to Jesus, he gives you a resurrection life, like Greg Laurie's ministry theme, you know, a new beginning, right? A clean slate, a fresh start, clean hands, a clean sweep, a clear conscience, where all your past mistakes are forgiven and left behind. Living in a cloud of defeat, you now have a renewed spirit and victory. Right? That's, that's Romans 8. Living a resurrected life means leaving your past, dead and buried, to live a new life in Jesus with no turning back. It is Christ Jesus who sets us free from our sins. And he gives us a new identity, When we choose to follow him, we're promised victory over sin and death. At Pentecost, he sent us a friend, and we call that friendship the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He makes the genuine and sincere believer able to build up, rearrange those things going on in our life that causes us to face up to the things of God. We we have that opportunity to look in the mirror and realize that things that we're doing are not really kosher. They're not really following the love of Christ. They're not really, they haven't really become a way of life that we can share with our family and they can see us as role models. But we we face up to things, the things of God. And through the work of the Holy Spirit, true believers develop a, a thirst and a hunger for what God says in his word. And that hunger and thirst becomes a desire to please the Lord by listening to his instructions, to be willing and ready without hesitation to be obedient to our best ability. Someone who shows no evidence for the things of God with no inspiration to seek and to please the Lord is probably not a Christian. Before our spiritual rebirth There may have been a time when we viewed the Bible as a storybook for kids, right? 
Egyptian and Roman empires made into Hollywood movies, like the Ten Commandments, Ben-Hur, the robe and the passion of Christ. Before Hollywood, the Bible may have been a boring book to a lot of us here today. But now, we've all come to realize that reading, understanding, and believing in Jesus gives us the capacity to change our lives. We see other believers in Christ Jesus who are in the same spiritual family. You know, and it, and it draws us to worship with that family. Just look around us today, right? Isn't that what's going on here today? You know, we are a group of changed men, dead to sin and alive in Christ. Pray with me. Father God, we just ask that you, that you continue to build up this momentum as we grow stronger in understanding the book of Romans in chapter 8. Lord, let the things that we hear become a part of our lives as we, as we continue to grow in you when we leave this building, when we go out into the streets, into to our homes, our jobs. Let, us all, let that all come into a, a, into a head where we can put things together and see, hey, we are different. We have changed. We thank you for the Lord. We thank you for that. And we pray that, that you use us in a mighty way in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 6. Verse 1, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Did you think that the more you sin, the greater the grace that you would receive? You know, that's, that's a crazy verse in my mind. You know, did you think that if you sin more, you'd get more grace? And then Paul says, Romans 6 verse 2, certainly not. Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it. When you sell your house and you buy another house, right, do you pay the same mortgage lender? No, right? Of course not. You pay the new mortgage lender, your mortgage monthly payment. Your life changed owners when you chose Jesus. You died to that previous owner and received your salvation, which marked the beginning of your Christian life. Romans 6, 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in new, newness of life. Baptism, the full immersion of going under the water, is a metaphor, a picture of being buried and coming up from the water as the rising from the dead. Baptism illustrates and exemplifies a spiritual reality, but in and of itself, remember, baptism is a metaphor and does not give you salvation. Just the same, if you have not spiritually died to sin, if you have not risen with Jesus as Lord and Savior, what then did baptism do for you? Right? You can't say that you died to sin and that you left your sin behind as fully cleansed without it changing your life, without being born again. The true and sincere believer has a real spiritual death and resurrection with Jesus. When it comes to your spiritual life, do you even know where or how you fit in? Have you given it any thought? After all your church hopping, you know, what have you learned today? What value do you place on your church experiences? Do you, does, does your uh, spirit-filled life come by your faith in Jesus? Let me tell you this story about two bills. A torn and, and ragged $1 bill discovered that it was about to be retired from circulation. As it slowly moved along the conveyor belt to the shredder, it became acquainted and struck up a conversation with a $50 bill that was meeting the same faith. The 50 began reminiscing about his travels all over the country. Life has been good, the $50 bill exclaimed. Why, I've been to Las Vegas, 
I've been to the finest restaurants in New York. I've attended political fundraisers, and I just returned from a cruise on the Caribbean. The one dollar bill said, you're fortunate to have been able to visit all those places. So where all have you been in your lifetime, my little friend, said the 50. Well, I've been to the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, the Episcopal Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Lutheran Church, the Calvary Chapel Churches in La Mirada, La Palma, Garden Grove, and Glendale. I've been to the Salvation Army Church, right? the Orthodox Church, the Assembly of God Church, the Brethren Church, the Quaker Church, the Pente Pentecostal Church, and the Charismatic Church. Excuse me, said the 50, but what's a church? And just like that, you know, you can say, I've gone to the men's retreat for the last eight years, and whenever there's a men's conference, I'll be there. Now, has the value of those experiences changed your life and brought you closer to Jesus? Romans 8, 12 to 17, the sun sonship through the Spirit. Whoever believes in Christ are no longer under the power of sin, the law, and death. But they now live under the dominion of the Spirit. You see, the Spirit of Christ now controls and directs them. That means a turning point, a radical change that makes the apostle sing for joy in this chapter. Because those former slaves of sin will walk now as children of God. Speaking to all of us. We now walk as children of God. Paul speaks of the Holy Spirit as the spirit of sonship. That does not mean that we become children of God through the working of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Lord has already adopted his children in Christ. The status of our sonship is unyielding in Christ's sacrifice on the cross. But Paul tells us that it is the Holy Spirit who teaches us to live in his gracious privilege as sons, as free children of God. When someone has been in prison for many years and suddenly is released, he's free indeed. I don't know if you have any family members who have been in prison for you know, 10, 15, 20 years and then get released. It's difficult for them to make it on the outside. But now, that person must learn to live as a free man. It's true, we as believers have been redeemed by Christ from sin and from the law and death. But every day, we have to learn to stand up. I just can't help say, my, my grandson, uh, Johnny's son, Canaan, and I'm, I make a joke of it, but it seems to be the truth. He's the first member of our church to ha have been persecuted for his faith. He's a four-year-old boy in the preschool. And they asked him to uh, stop talking about God and Jesus so much. They're getting complaints from other families because their children are going home talking about it. He's our first persecuted member of our church. Isn't that awesome? We're <laughs> you see him running around here all the time. Caden, I don't know if Johnny is still in here. He's probably out with Caden right now. I don't see Johnny. But yeah, it's, it's, that's an awesome little side note, you know. <laughs> but every day we have to learn to stand, to take a stand in the freedom with which Christ has set us free. This is where the Holy Spirit comes to our benefit. He is the spirit of sonship who teaches us to live as free and joyful children of God. Now, you know, all you brothers in Christ, turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 8 verse 12, to a time when lifestyle choices are decided. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Now, brethren, of course, talking about us, brothers in Christ. We're all believers in Jesus, right? Paul was dealing with Christians here in Romans 8, and he says, we, 
including Paul himself, are debtors. Not debtors to the flesh, because our debt is to the Lord. But since Jesus went to the cross at Calvary for, for us, and rose from the dead to give us eternal life, we owe something to him. Something. It doesn't necessarily mean making a donation to the church or, or volunteering in, in a ministry at the church. But we owe him something. We're debtors to God's plan of salvation in Christ. The flesh has no rights to the believer. They don't, own a, they don't owe us a thing. They don't own any portion of us in my head. But for some reason, the weakness of men give in now and then and to, to things that we should not mess with. The Christian believer has a, a negative and a positive sphere of responsibility. We have an obligation to live under the control of the Holy Spirit and the responsibility not to allow the flesh to dominate us. That is, not to live according to the flesh, but to live according to the Spirit. Not living to the flesh is not to live within, but it is living within a capacity to sin. To live in the capacity of sin can be seen in two ways. One, it's within a human's ability to tolerate the maximum amount of sin. We have that ability. We can go pretty far in our sin. We have that capacity to handle a lot. A glutton for sin is having uncontrollable desires, like the craving of a nymphomaniac sexual desire. Two, the ability of human beings to commit sin. Only human beings, all of God's creation, possess free will, and therefore, only human beings are capable of sin. And only human beings willing, willingly disobey God's commands. A recovering alcoholic takes his wife out to dinner. The restaurant has a 45 minute wait before you can be seated. But there's an open, open table at the, at the bar area. There are hundreds of bottles of alcohol on the shelves and the smell of beer floating around as it's poured out on tap. That's living within sin's capacity. It's all there, you know, and that alcoholic probably struggling, right? Or working with a group of men and it's Super Bowl week. So the office puts together a Super Bowl pool. You know those things with numbers on it and you, you gamble, sort of, right? And you've always been a risk taker. At, you know, at the Las Vegas casinos, you rolled the dice. You were a novice card counter playing blackjack. That is, until you lost the money for the house payment. You're still living within sin's capacity all around you. The Christian believer is under no obligation to subject himself to offensive demands of the flesh. We don't have to. The believer does not have to live on terms of the flesh. The spirit is the counterforce that can make a difference in your life. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is in those believers in Christ. Verse 13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For if you believers in Christ Jesus continue to live according to the flesh, you will die. Now, you're not going to be you know, hit by a bolt of lightning you know, right out of heaven. doesn't mean that. But you're, you're going to die and not receive that eternal life. The New Testament Greek meaning for flesh is described in this way. As a physical and functioning body, all parts of the body in total is known as the flesh. And the flesh is dominated by sin to such a degree that wherever flesh is, all forms of sin are with it and no good thing can live. So Paul keeps it real simple. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. That's 
how can you explain it any simpler than that? But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If you come out from under that dark cloud and put to death the sinful deeds of the body, you will live. True living the life of God occurs when we deal with sin. To control that flesh problem is to live the life of the Spirit. Now you notice, it doesn't mean that we clean it all up and it's gone, you know, like Pastor Johnny said. We're still dealing, dealing with sin today. Even though six years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we gave our lives to the Lord, some became pastors, some became minister leaders, some became, you know, worship leaders, you know, musicians, you know, teachers in the children's ministry. But we all still sin, we still deal with it. We need to control that flesh problem. And to do that is to live the life of the Spirit. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. True believers of Jesus are led by the Spirit. And to be led by the Spirit comes from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And it is an action by which God takes up permanent residence in the body of the believer in Jesus Christ. I like that. That gives me strength, you know, to continue with the things that, that I need to do, you know, here at Calvary Chapel Glendale. I went, I went to McDonald's to pick up those sausage McMuffins, and the machine broke down, okay? And so there's a guy standing behind me who can obviously can see that the machine isn't working, and so he starts needling me with these little comments, you know. He says, well, he takes, takes out his, his ATM card. He says, don't you have a card or something so you can pay your bill? And, and I looked at him. He didn't know what's going on, you know. And uh, so I turned to the lady. And I said, you know, maybe you need some help because she's just a cashier lady taking the money, st struggling with it. But, you know, I'm under a little pressure because I want things to be timely here. I want to pick up the food on time so everybody has it when they come in. And so I'm beginning to stress out just a little bit with that guy's comments because he gave me a real nasty look, right? So first, we hear about God and understand who God is. So I'm thinking, you know what? I'm about ready to get into a conference with a group of men. You know, we're going to talk about Jesus and Romans 8. You know, I've got to let it go, right? And according to God's plan for our lives, we come to believe in what we hear and what we understand. But I was letting him go. And that is our faith in Christ, just as our Lord and Savior. And it is then that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. You know that he's there with you because he helped you through that little struggle, right? We know that it is then that we are led by the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. These are our sons of God. Verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. You, where it says you did not receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which means somebody was not found acceptable. So that man or that woman did not become a Christian. This also becomes the moment when each person who became a Christian was marked as legally accepted to God. It is that point in life in which believers are legally and irrevocably transferred into the status of his sonship. That spirit of bondage is a spirit that brings about slavery of the soul. Non-Christians are slaves to sin. They 
attempt to gain God's praise by performing works, something to, to get them by through a church service, knowing in the background things are going on in their lives. Like walking the streets of a neighborhood, you know, each week, you know, until all the streets have been covered, you know, you, you're pacing through, you covered all the streets like a, like a walking evangelist that, we, that you know the group, they knock on the door, and when you open the door, you're going to get an earful, but you give them that attention. But these people, once they finish the whole neighborhood, they start over, you know, maybe a month down the road. Uh, my grandfather used to put a sign outside our window by the front door that's saying, uh, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses stay away. Uh, my family was split in half when, when uh, Jehovah's Witness theology came into, into our home. So I'm free to talk about that. I really experienced it, right? And there's a, another way of looking at this. Pastor Chuck Smith talked about it, which set him on that path to start the Calvary Chapel churches and, and a biblical way of teaching the Bible consistently. He was asked to participate in a, in a church recruitment contest with the other churches that were within that denomination. And the winner would receive, I don't know, it's, uh, cash money or something. But he saw that that was wrong. And so he began teaching the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. And in doing that, he won the contest, but he didn't receive or want to receive any of the, of the rewards that came with it. But before our own salvation, before we decided to attend a church on a regular basis, we were spiritual slaves. We thought our salvation was won by doing more, that is more ministry participation, you know, maybe even increasing our tithings, we're going to get closer to God. Becoming a Christian does not put the believer back into a legalistic system of slavery, you know, feeling inadequate and unable to measure up to the law or to God, which a lot of people feel, you know, that they need to do in order to feel like they are a Christian, you know, in order to be more acceptable. The new believer in Jesus has the status of acceptance with God and because of the principle of adoption or sonship we're free towards God it is the assurance of salvation by which we receive and have come to appreciate what God has given us the fear comes from the fear of abandonment Children of God have no fear of God abandoning them. The, the seal of, of that adoption that we receive is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We're like a child disciplined by our father or our mother, you know, and sad as a child may get for getting caught and receiving a spanking, receiving that discipline, but when it's all said and done, that we are then snuggled up with our parents when we were a child, we snuggled up to them, to that same parent that disciplined us, knowing as you cuddle that you will continue to be loved and cared for by that same person who disciplined you. Christians can approach God on similar personal terms. We can talk to the Father as a son would. The words cry out are, are intense when, when it says cry out. Abba, which is Aramaic for father, and then father, which is, is in the Greek. Both of these words mean the same thing. Again, referring to terms of a personal relationship. They're, they are family words, and by using both words, Paul strengthens the cry to God the Father. A man who applies these terms in prayer to God the Father, like a child who prays you know, and ask for help from his father, has the spirit of a Christian. When you, you know, it's such a blessing to hear children pray because they're so innocent in their prayer. They don't understand the full meaning of what they're saying, but they know what they're saying is important to them. When they, you know, ask God, you know, bless my mama, bless my daddy, 
You know, and as they get older, that will change because you know who is God the Father and so you pray to God the Father for help, for things that you need. But like most men, most of us here today, we shy away, shy away from corporate prayer. You know, if you are uh, in dire need of prayer, you know, for sure you look for a private place. Right? Women are not so shy. You know, their crying during prayer is more like weeping, right? And often you can hear that when you hear of a group of women praying, where their emotions are not held back. It's hard for me to listen to women pray when that's going on. It just breaks my heart. It reminds me of, of the sadness and the hardships that I experience within my own family, the women in my own family, crying out for a loved one in the hospital or praying for a loved one just sentenced to life in prison is heartbreaking. And you cry out in prayer, and you cry out to, to Abba Father. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our, with our spirit that we are children of God. This is what it's called a double testimony that we are God's children. The Spirit does not bear witness to our spirit, but with our spirit. The Holy Spirit, along with our spirit, establishes and gives concrete evidence of something that is true. True faith is, 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 is an amazing thing to experience. I know, I don't know about uh, Johnny or Asher or Dickie, but you know, when, I'm, when I prepare for a Bible study, I'm all in. You know, I, I believe what I'm reading, I believe what I'm studying, and I believe what I'm saying. Doesn't mean I might make a mistake here and there, but I believe it. I'm fully engulfed. And so when I come to church to teach, it's really hard for me to, to hear, to have, you know, members of the church approach me and saying they're having difficulties at home with, the, you know, with their son or their daughter, although I need to pay attention to that. I'm like, I'm like, in a, I'm temporarily in another world. I'm, I'm, I'm in the Bible. And so I have to excuse myself and ask them if they could see me after church. And so that happens quite often. I don't know about you, but uh, at times things can be so difficult to, to listen to and, and, and you can't ignore it that it, it takes you away from what you're about to do within the next 10, 15 minutes. And so what I've been doing, and the guys in my church know, I don't come into the sanctuary until it's time for me to come up, get the microphone, and then come up to the pulpit. For that reason, I, I have to protect the message, you know? And that's been hard for me to deal with because I really listen to people when they, when they have difficulties going on. But we are the children of God. We are related to God by spiritual birth, we were once in a Gentile family separated from God, but now we are children who know our Father. Verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with them, that we may also be glorified together. Verse 17 introduces the theme of the inheritance of the believer. This inheritance flows out of the idea of the sonship, like children who receive inheritance from their parents. An heir is someone who receives property or some value from someone else, usually a parent or a, a grandfather or uncle. And if children or heirs of God, they inherit prerogatives. You know, that was a new word to me. I, was, I always thought prerogative, it's not the same word prerogatives or privileges from God. This is a factual and fulfilled condition in our souls from God. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we belong to God's family. We, we have that privilege from God. The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we belong to God's family. That we, then we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Christians share their inheritance with the one 
who never dies so that all Christians will share Christ's inheritance. The source of this inheritance is, is God himself. It is his to give. He's not only the source of our inheritance, but he himself is our inheritance. We cannot receive this inheritance without Christ Jesus. This is, a, this is our inheritance comes from our relationship with Christ Jesus. Scripture does not teach us to be led like leading a horse to water. Nor does the Bible teach us through subjective mental impressions or, or promptings to provide direction in making life's decisions. Instead, God's Spirit leads believers in Jesus who are his children and, and by his planning through the coordination of circumstances in two ways. That's pretty heavy duty stuff I just said. Well, these are the two circumstances that we are led. One, illumination by divinely clarifying scripture. That is to make it understandable, the verses that we read, to make it understandable to our sinful and limited minds. God breaks that down for us to our own understanding. And secondly, by sanctification, divinely enabling us to obey scripture. You see, when a person experiences the Spirit's leading in those two ways, the person gains assurance that God has adopted him into his family, into his sonship. And it, it is that spirit within us that makes us God's children. Does that make sense? It's heavy duty stuff. That's why I said I got the hard one. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I think I think Johnny did, but okay. But as as I close, let's keep in mind that the theme is all about Jesus. Everything is all about Jesus. But when we and when we pray, it's all about Jesus. And so I pray right now that the words that I am about to say speaks to your hearts and to your minds because we are all here brothers in Christ and we all came here today to learn more about Jesus. Pray with me. We ask you Lord Jesus to open the eyes of our understanding and take away our ignorance. Train our ears to understand the voice of the Spirit. Jesus reveal your counsel to us today. Show us the next step to take in life. Help us to settle every area of our confused life. Comfort us in times of frustration. Grant us peace and happiness. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.